Barbara Bingham Cady, like crazy except for the C. I was born September 20th, 1906, in Richmond Center, Wisconsin, in, Stur no, in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, up in the Thumb. And I had my 95th birthday in September last. My father was a country doctor down over here in, in southwestern Wisconsin, in Lafarge, in the Kickapoo Valley, it was called. My mom's dad was a physician um, in 1900, Sturgeon Bay, where she was born. Barbara's mom was her dad's nurse. So that's how they got together, I guess. They thought they probably weren't going to have a child at all. They came down to Chicago to adopt when her mother found she was pregnant. So they came home and they had me. Here I am. I went to the University of Wisconsin, Universitatis Wisconsin, and to Newman for my BS. Then I went to New York City and I took a double major at Columbia University in nutrition and chemistry. And she's well educated. She was a she had a bachelor's degree, has a bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin in home economics. We call it human ecology now, right? And um, then she has a master's degree in, I think, nutrition from Columbia. I know Barbara because I took an intro to therapeutic recreation class last year, and I was assigned to her. She was my client. I think she's smarter at 95 than most people are at any other age. <laughs> We met at, at when I was at college in the University of Wisconsin. Uh, my cousin brother was going with two girls, and this was a fraternity party, so he invited both girls, and he got a fraternity brother of his, my husband, namely, to, to date the other girls. And it was hot in those days, no air conditioning, it was very warm, so we went out on a side porch to sit down and the porch had a little side porch had a railing and my husband then took out his handkerchief and wiped off the railing and I thought it how nice because I had a beautiful silk chiffon dress on and how gentlemanly and then he said sat down and he said here come here and kiss me and I did and then we dated after that. We met at Wisconsin and in those days families were very conservative in those days and I think Barbara kind of got sent to New York City to separate her from Ken. In those days you didn't get married until you went through college and had a job and were working and then you could get married. The family wanted her to um, and so she went to New York, studied, but then she, after graduating, she came back um, and then I guess my dad and mom were probably married in 1933. We were married during the Depression, and I worked in New York City and lost $300 in New York City during the Depression in the bank failure. People jumped out of windows sometimes in the stuff on the stock market. I have two children, seven grandchildren and eight great-grandchildren. She talks about her family a lot and how important her family is to her, especially her son and daughter. And She knows how many grandkids and great-grandchildren she has and names them all and knows where they all are, what they've been doing. She keeps up to date with her family and I think they're very important. Also, another important aspect in why she's aged successfully, I know her son, um, Bing, who I've actually never met, but he comes to visit her, I think, every morning for coffee. She goes out with him on the weekend. During the First World War, I was little. My grandmother had taught me how to knit, so I knitted scarves for the soldiers. And I remember there's a little bitty girl singing, this is little kids, and afraid. You know, because we were happy that the war was over. In World War II, I don't remember except that it was rumored, always that FDR started it. The bomb Pearl Harbor suggested it so that we could, he could have another term. The foreign press always believed that. I can't prove it though, so I shouldn't say that. My husband uh, enlisted for the Navy, but his vision was not good enough. And when he was called to draft, they didn't want him. So he didn't go to war. Fortunately, we knew many people who did. I think my parents 
and World War II, when I was a little boy, were very impressive to me. I remember um, blackouts in Chicago, and I remember um, the Lily, a uh, Japanese student who lived with us during the war, and that was controversial by some of my parents' friends. <laughs> in Pease Laboratory, T-E-A-S-E, the Pease Broadway on Fifth Avenue on 39th Street in New York City. And I t tested the toxicities and efficacies of anything that you put on your face or in any orifice of your body. So men should not use aftershave rose when you've heard this. You just use with hazel. And if you're too poor to buy toothpaste, use baking soda. It works. And Ann Murrow, before she married Lindbergh, was one of the, one of the other people that worked there. And I remember very well when the baby was, they were married and their baby was kidnapped. I will never forget it because they finally found the gentleman, the gentleman, the man who did it. And he was properly convicted. But before that, they tried him in court. They asked Lindbergh about it and he said that he would never ever forget the sound of his voice because the man said, ask for $2,000, ransom money. And Lindbergh said, here it is. And he said, no, I don't want the money. Keep the money. I want more than that. And Lindbergh said, I will never, ever forget the sound of that man's voice. And that was enough to convict him, except that it didn't until he was do properly convicted in the courts. I can't remember his name now. It doesn't matter. It's a very sad story. To my mommy on the way I in an auditorium, you know, the speaker system that's up on the wall high. Yes, and Basil Belusov invented that. And he took me over to have tea with Rachmaninoff, the famous Russian pianist. And they spoke Russian together. But I couldn't understand it, of course. Yalovovas. Yalovovas means I love you in Russian. Yavashluba means I love you. Yalovovas means I love you a great deal. He was a good friend of my daughter's and mine. And his eyes are bluer than anybody's blue here in the room. And I, his daughter, Nell Dupa, Nell, Nellie Newman was in the same grade school as my granddaughter, the Princess Kendall. And I was in some affair that the school, grade school was giving, and I was sitting next to Paul. And he looked at me and I looked at him, and his eyes were really, honest to God, it's so truly blue that you can't believe it. And his wife, Joanne Woodard, used to shop in the grocery store just like anybody else and carry her groceries home. You have my book of poems. Don't you ever read it? I like the one on Chicago the best. The city of Chicago, I don't remember it, so I can't repeat it. But I love the one about boredom. Ennui, his fumes consume and devour the heart, the soul, the mind, leave ennui behind. Being verbose is mentally gross. That's what I am. That's my grandson, Charlie. My Charlie Doodle Duck is a fair haired boy with cheeks of tan. In Charlie's world, anybody can. Charlie's world is filled with grass and trees. Grass and flowers and trees. In Charlie's world, there are good bees. The recipe for a woman, you love him, I know. You want him, I trust. And you wait on him always. This is a must. These three attitudes, properly done, will get the best man under the sun and keep him. Recipe for a man. Seduce, subdue, and subsidize. Or put a gleam to a woman's eyes. Any one of these will do to make her happier, try to, to keep her free from any fall. Do them all. <laughs> She'd been over to see Longview a couple of times. I'd brought her over, and they and I asked to have her placed there in January on the fourth floor in the assisted living floor. And they say, well, there's a um, an interview. You have to come to an interview. So we had our formal interview, and I take Barbara to the interview, and we go down the hall in um, Longview into a room, not unlike this room, only somewhat bigger, but a table like this. And the two young ladies, they're about your age, right? They're college age employees um, uh, sit across from Barbara and myself and um, to break the ice one of them says well Mrs. Katie now that you've seen Longview what do you think 
And Barbara looks across at her and she said, I'd commit suicide before I'd live in a place like this. And everybody just sunk. I couldn't think of anything to say. The girls, of course, couldn't think of anything to say. And Barbara was quiet. Then, um, then in the back of the room, there was another young lady, college age, who had been sitting reading, not paying much attention, but she heard that she started to laugh. And then the girl started to laugh, and then I started to laugh, and things lightened up. For an institution of this kind, ma'am, you have to give them credit. And my partner and I were actually assigned to Bill, but since Barb and Bill won't separate, we got both of them. He and I were entered Longview the same day at the same hour, and his twin sons brought us in. Son and daughter, his twins, son and daughter, and Eddie lives in Jerusalem. Anyway, they brought us in, and we start we sitting together like you are, and somebody started talking. Probably I started talking first, because I talk all the time. And uh, it turned out that we had much in common: our love of New York City and our families, and the death of our re recent death of our spouses, and uh, our children, and. Uh, we had so much in common that we became immediate friends. Not friends, but just neither one of us could stand it here without each other. Seriously. Bill's family, his daughter takes them out. So I think that's another important aspect is that she has family and friends to go to and to talk to. And I think that it's important for her to make sure that she does a lot of interesting things because she is so intelligent that if there's lack of interest in her life, that's just going to add to her decrease um, in cognitive compa capacity. So I think it's important for her to keep doing interesting things. She goes on, I know she goes on the Monday country ride, and she goes to the Kmart, which aren't very stimulating, but she also has friends that she speaks to. She does current events. So she does activities um, that keep her well-adjusted and keep her up-to-date and using her incredible mind that she has. Back to you, the Andrews sisters. In my day, if you had sex appeal, you had it. I could use a Charleston and the Irish jig and all that stuff. But if you had it, that meant sex appeal in my day, in the 20s. And now there's just signs all over outside in the house, every place you go. X it. I'm an X it. My favorite story is a story about how in the 20s, if you had sex appeal, you had it. And now that she's older, she's an ex-it, and there's signs all over the city for her. <laughs> there's a, a hymn, which I happen to like very much. All, all day through, whatever you do, God will take care of you. If you, you know, you knock on wood when you say something, and I hope it's true. And this is Bill's son, Eddie, the tw twin that lives in Jerusalem. That's when you touch the cross and ask for help. So it's really a Christian symbol. I think it's fascinating because everybody does that. Remember this, don't try and diet or some crap like that, excuse the expression, some stupid attitude. Eat like a king in the morning, a prince at noon, and a pauper at night. And it makes sense because during the day you're going to use up the calories in activities the morning and a prince at noon you eat less because you're less active in the afternoon and a pauper at night because you're not doing anything but sleepy so the calories are not used up. Well you know what you should do in college don't you? You should listen to the lectures carefully and take notes and then when the exam time comes just read your notes and don't cram for an exam. Seriously, but listen carefully to the lectures. Sure, a little bit of heaven fell from out the sky one day and nestled in the ocean in a spot so far away. And when the angels found it, so it looked so sweet and bare, they said, suppose we leave it, for it looks so peaceful there. So they sprinkled it with stardust just to make the shamrocks grow. It's the only place you'll find them no matter where you go. And they dotted it with silver just to make the lake so grand. And when they had it finished, so they called it Ireland. And when Irish eyes are smiling, it is like a morning spring, and the lilt of Irish laughter, you can hear the angels sing. <laughs>